Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Very good afternoon to all of you. And I'd like to especially pay my respect to our guest of honor, Mr. Jeff Emelt from GE, along with his colleagues, uh, including Stuart and Henry. And of course, I'd like to pay my respect to Pat Sofian, Pat Surio Solisto, uh, and their buddies from Apindo and Karin, and of course, Pai Lam from HME and the Kin guys. Uh, and of course, Para Harir and Yang, so it might be. It's not every year, it's not every day, it's not every month that we get visited by somebody like Jeff who came all the way from the U.S. to Indonesia to help further solidify the foundation that has been laid and put by the team in GE in Indonesia in the last few years. I've got to be able to testify to the fact that it wasn't easy for GE at times when they were trying to do business in Indonesia. And surely this was not unique. This was probably not dissimilar to some of their experiences in other developing economies. But I was really touched and I'm really impressed with how they have persevered throughout the process. And this is, I think, a reflection of not just their patience, but also their view taking with respect to Indonesia. All of you, I think, know where Indonesia is and where Indonesia is headed. Indonesia is an economy that needs to continue positioning itself in a better way. And that includes branding, but it includes entailing more innovative capacity for Indonesia and Indonesians. That's the stuff that we try to do at Davos at the World Economic Forum. That's the stuff that we try to do at every international arena that we enter. The topic today is quite apt in terms of being able to live in a globalized economy. What sort of a leadership is required? When people ask me what leadership is about, uh, my simple answer is that it's really about selfless service. It's really about being able to adapt to any situation that you're thrown into. I mean, I was not too long ago working with a completely different paradigm, doing a completely different set of things. And today, I'm in the government, most likely not making as much money as you are. <laughs> but I think I can say quite happily that I'm doing something for the country. I'm doing something for the nation. I'm doing something that I think would be good for the country and the people of Indonesia. That should be the narrative the thesis that we would like GE to be involved with in Indonesia. And I think GE has exemplified not just the character, but I think in terms of execution in Indonesia, in terms of what we need for the next 10 to 20 years, be it in the context of building locomotives, be it in the context of helping Garuda and some of the other airlines with respect to their engines and what have you. What matters is that we will be more relevant. I have told many of you in the past that Indonesia's economy is shining, but it is shining with some caveats. The caveats are important for us to note, important for us to improve upon. And the typical caveats, you all know what those are. But I think it's important to note 
that if we were to invest our time and money in educating ourselves, in educating everybody that we can, that we see in front of us, that I think will make a difference. A few minutes ago, we were talking about how we can game change a country. I think we're game changing it, but we're probably not game changing it as much as we should be. Good news is we've got the fiscal space. The space that's going to be needed for us to spend on more high quality, high quantity stuff that matters to the future of Indonesia. This is a unique time for Indonesia. A unique time from a trade standpoint where we've got to be sitting with many economies around the world to hammer out regional comprehensive economic partnerships other multilateral or bilateral or regional amalgamations of economies, be it from free trade or free trade investment and capacity building. This is going to go head in hand, hand in hand and head to head with some of the other amalgamations that other more developed economies are contemplating. One of which is the TPP, Trans-Pacific Partnership, which involves a lot of developed economies in the Asia Pacific area. The world is going to get more competitive. And if we don't learn to be global, if we don't learn to be more educated, I think it's going to get rougher. And that's why it's a real honor for me to welcome Jeff to basically shed some light on all of us in terms of what not only what GE is doing with Indonesia, but what he thinks and what GE thinks about the world and where it sits and where it's going to be in the next many decades. Thank you very much. You know, I was, uh, I was early when I was born, so I've always been early. <laughs> so it's great, very rarely do you get two introductions, but I, I like both. Gita, thank you, and uh, it's really an honor for me to be here with you uh, this evening with the business community. And, and uh, you know, I, I think it's great uh, uh, government needs a voice of business, and it's uh, great that you serve your country, and I think that's very admirable uh, and, and very needed. So, so thanks to all of you uh, to be, uh, uh, for the invitation to be here tonight. I'm going to really try to talk a little bit about the world, a little bit about the company, uh, a little bit about what every business person sh you know, maybe should be thinking about right now, and then how Gene views Indonesia. So I'm just going to kind of go through uh, uh, those things uh, in a very conversational way. Uh, you know, I, I always think that people keep expecting the world to get suddenly better, but I, I think we're in kind of a, a, this, this slow recovery, kind of what I call the sixth year in the, uh, in the new world, in the, in the reset era. And the characteristics of each year, I think, tend to be more or less the same. Uh, the developed world, uh, the U.S. actually gets better every day. Housing is a little bit better. You know, it's, uh, uh, things are, are continue to make progress, but the progress is slow. So the economy continues to recover, but unemployment's high, and, and there's some real positive aspects about the U.S. today, but, but none of us are happy with the growth rate the way it is. Uh, Europe, at least, is not going to implode. That's what everybody worried about maybe a year ago, and Europe seems to be stable in a, at, a, at a very slow growth uh, time period. So you've got 60% of the global, the, the historic uh, global GDP, which is growing at below what the long-term potential has been. And, and the real incremental driver of growth in, in the world today is coming from the growth in emerging markets. And that both is in Asia, driven by population, but it also is driven by uh, the redistribution of wealth created by relatively high uh, resource pricing. Uh, you know, people forget that in, uh, for most of my career, let's say the 80s and the 90s and up until 2003, oil was about $15 a barrel. Just that one change has driven an immense change on the global arena. You could take out the oil and put in iron ore and things like that. So population, resource, uh, pricing tends to be what drives at least the world that we look at today. And I think this is going to continue. Uh, a strength in the emerging markets, a billion uh, new consumers joining the middle class on a global basis, 
and, and a slow recovery in the developed world as the fiscal situations need to be sorted out and, and need to be restructured. So I, I look at the world and kind of am, am quite optimistic, but it's going to be a different economy over the next five years than it was uh, for the previous 25 years. And, and so when I think about GE, that's the company we try to construct, one that can grow in the emerging markets, uh, one that uh, can prosper in times of volatility and continue to invest. I joined GE in 1982. All of GE in 1982 was $24 billion, the whole company. Uh, in 2013, will be about twice that amount just in the emerging markets. So that's one generation, one lifetime, let's say, inside a company like GE, and it just shows uh, the changes that, uh, that have taken place. Uh, GE in 2012 was about a little bit more than $150 billion uh, in revenue. Uh, more than 60% of our revenue is outside the United States. Uh, we are a company of 100 or uh, 300,000 people. We do business in 150 countries around the world. Uh, we're, in essence, a technology company. We, we reinvest about 6% of our industrial revenue back into uh, R&D every year, and, and very much of a global enterprise. Uh, we very much look at our ability to compete in, in, in every corner of the world as being a strong competitive advantage. And, and we have these deep customer and country relationships that have existed for, uh, for generations. So, the, the central core competency of GE are technology, a global footprint, development of people, and, and a deeply embedded relationship with customers. That's kind of who we are. We always think, uh, you know, GE's a 130-year-old uh, uh, company, and we always think culture is important in terms of what makes uh, uh, companies uh, great. And the GE culture really has four pillars. Uh, we're mission-based. So the people that come to work for GE believe in what we do. We, we build, we power, we move, we cure the world. People very much are, relate to the things that our, our products do. Uh, we believe in a better way. We never believe we're the best in the world at anything. We're constantly looking for the next best practice, someplace we can learn. And, and we think that is a big part of our culture. We, we invest a billion dollars here in training, and we're always trying to get better. We believe in solutions for our society and for our customers. So we're always trying to take the breadth of the company to try to create broad solutions and, and ways to uh, drive development. And that's been a big part of, uh, of who we are. And we're a we company, not a me company. This is a company that believes in teamwork. It's a company where the company always comes first. It stands above any individual in, uh, in the company. So mission-based, search for a better way, Solutions oriented, believe in the totality, that's GE. So that's where we are and, and, uh, and how we're progressing. Uh, in the top 10 in almost every metric uh, revenue earnings, market cap, uh, you name it, and, uh, and looking forward to the future in a very optimistic way. So that's the world, that's the company. What I thought I'd do and share with you is kind of, you know, five concepts. Or ideas that I think will impact all of us in some way and that are quite important uh, uh, for the future and, and, and just give you it's not that I have the answers uh, to all of them but I thought it would be interesting at least to uh, to discuss the first one is to think about what the impact would be if the US was energy independent well what would it mean for the world uh, if you look today uh, the reserves of shale gas in the U.S. are significant, even more than have been uh, developed or, or even talked about. Uh, Canada and Mexico actually have very complementary fuel. So, so Canada uh, and, and Mexico have oil. The U.S. is kind of the Saudi Arabia of natural gas, if you will. There's pipelines that basically go from Canada to Mexico as a region this is a formidable uh, region. Uh, probably, electricity can be generated unsubsidized in the United States for five cents a kilowatt hour. So you basically look at an electricity, delivered electricity in the US that could drive competitiveness on a global basis uh, uh, in a very profound way versus Europe, versus Japan, certainly, and maybe versus other parts of the world. 
So I would suggest that this is a very important thing, very important trend that could have an impact on uh, the way that globalization, global competitiveness uh, takes place. And it's certainly a place where GE is investing and investing heavily, both in the extraction, but also in demand creation. Uh, we're working on things like uh, uh, making locomotives instead of using diesel fuel, using natural gas, trucks using natural gas instead of diesel. Uh, household appliances go down the list. So there's a tremendous amount of activity going on, just at, at not only in the extraction, but also in the, in the consumption of natural gas. So this is very much a gas-driven world. This is very much a theme that I think is investable, and it's going to change the dynamics on a global basis. So that's big theme number one. Big theme number two, I would say, is the nature of globalization, at least in my career, my lifetime, has switched from being maybe a, 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 a search for uh, less expensive labor to being all about markets, 100% about markets. So when I think about globalization today, when I think about incremental invest investment decisions, it's all about how I can become big in a country or big in a region. Now, probably the, the lowest tech product GE makes today is refrigerant. And look, I love all my products in my company, so I love all of them equally, and they're all exciting in their own way. Refrigerator has two hours of labor in it, two hours of labor. So when a product only has two hours of labor, it doesn't really matter where you make it. And a lot of our products from a cost standpoint are much bigger material than labor. So for me today, the journey is which markets do we want to invest in? And any time you invest in a factory, you invest in a country. You become part of the local. Uh, and, and you can still export from that base. We still want to be competitive. We still want to be economic. But I would say to you that the big theme in globalization for multinationals is localization. Is, is how to find a way to be locally relevant and still have global scale. And so I, I think very intently about markets, what markets you want to be in, and that's quite important. So that's number two. So understand gas, understand the role of markets in, uh, in global competitiveness, because no longer is the search really just about a labor arbitrage on globalization. Point number three, um, the big differentiator in terms of how countries and companies compete today is in manufacturing is much or more than in uh, just pure R&D. Manufacturing is uh, sexy, again, maybe it never went out of style, but I would say your ability to control your supply chain, your ability to drive an effective supply chain, your ability to do it in a cost competitive and effective way, it is really incredibly important. There's new manufacturing technologies, things like high performance computing, uh, things like additive manufacturing, that are really changing the economics of how products need to be made. You can make now uh, low-cost, high-tech products in smaller facilities. You don't need to have uh, uh, so much scale to make uh, to make lower cost. And if you think about big projects uh, like some of the uh, subsea oil and gas activity that's going to happen in this country, the differentiation between whether that project is successful or unsuccessful is going to be delivered by the supply chain as much as, as it is by innovative uh, new technology. So manufacturing, I think, is the real core of where competitiveness is going to be in the future. So understand gas, localization is the new global theme, manufacturing is a new source of global competitiveness. Number four, all of the, uh, I, I look out in the audience and I see everybody has a, a, a device in their hand. Most of you are on Facebook or, or some of you are on the phone of Facebook. All of the technology that's inhabited social media over the last decade is all going to inhabit the industrial space in the next five or ten years. So the ability to drive analytics around a jet engine, around a subsequent Christmas tree, around an MR scanner, around a locomotive, is going to be uh, uh, the next wave of 
analytics and the next wave of computing. Uh, jet engine that we would have with Garuda would have, uh, or Lion Air, would have maybe 20 sensors on each one of the engines. We get continuous real-time data off each one of those engines. If we can model the entire fleet of GE jet engines to be just 1% more fuel efficient every year, 1% on our install base, it's worth $3 billion to the airline industry, $3 billion. So the modeling of data, the ability to get real-time, constant flow of data and analytics. And if you just took out somebody's face on Facebook and replaced it with a jet engine, right, which I personally find more sexy than, uh, <laughs> than, than the face, and you had all the data that you have on social media, you have on products, this is the next real game changer of productivity and technology that we think is quite exciting. So gas, localization, manufacturing, what we call the industrial internet is this evolution of analytics. And this often, you know, we can monitor a locomotive in Indonesia anywhere in the world. We can get real-time fuel data. And, and if you can drive a world where you have no unplanned downtime, just think what that's going to mean to unleash productivity. And that can be done anywhere in the world. So that's important. The fifth thing I would talk about is, is um, more just on the pure leadership side, which is, uh, I'd say a journey we've tried to go on the GE starting maybe 18 months or two years ago. You know, our challenge is we've got, we're in 150 countries, we've got eight industrial platforms, 300,000 people in a fast-paced world, and you know, what we're trying to do is just make the company simple. And I, I often kind of lay awake at night wondering if size is a curse, right? That it's just inevitable when you get to be of a certain size that you become too slow moving, become too distant from customers, and that there you, you constantly need to find ways to move faster. And so we launched, the, I would say the, lead, the leadership initiative inside GE today is called simplification. Part of it is structural in nature, and that is fewer layers between the field and headquarters, uh, how we actually uh, run headquarters, uh, distributed leadership, more people in the field. So part of it is structural, and part of it is cultural. Trying to find ways to drive speed, accountability, and compliance. One of the things I've done personally over the last 18 months is to spend more time with entrepreneurs. So, you know, I've had the the benefit of my lifetime to know people like Bill Gates and, and, uh, and Jeff Bezos and people like that. And reconnecting with entrepreneurs over the last the period of time, you know, again, I, I don't want GE to be a startup. I mean, we've got, we've got 50,000 engineers and scientists. That's a big competitive advantage versus small companies. We've got 45,000 salespeople. So I've got a massive engine of growth in GE. But there's something about the way that entrepreneurs move. There, there's a there's a there's a, a, a centrality to things that are important. There is a there is a, a notion that there's no such thing as headquarters. That, that basically everything serves the customer, serves the field, and that spirit is something I'm trying to bring back inside GE. That that size can be a massive strength as long as you're willing to kind of look at yourself in the mirror and make sure the structure doesn't get in your way and make sure the culture doesn't get in your way. And I think this activity is going to make us lower cost, it's going to make us faster, it's going to make us more capital. So those are five things that, that are on my mind. You know, the role of gas, the, the changing flow of natural gas and where that goes, manufacturing, localization, industrial internet, simplification. Those are five things that uh, if you if you want to think about the future, those would be the place to be. Uh, Indonesia. So Indonesia for GE, you know, is going to be uh, close to a billion dollars. In fact, we passed a billion dollars in orders last year. So Indonesia, you know, is, is now in a in a place that's uh, that's I think uh, sustainable at a higher scale level. Uh, basically, the country needs everything we sell. So we're an infrastructure company. Uh, probably the biggest infrastructure company in the world. Aviation, oil and gas, 
energy, healthcare, locomotives. I mean, I could go down the list. Basically, everything we do is needed here, and, and everything you know we can we can put here. The journey for Indonesia is very similar to other what we call resource-rich countries. You know, we segment the world. We don't we don't segment the G world into Americas, Europe, Asia. You know, classic differentiation. We kind of talk about uh, uh, China, India, rising Asia, China, and India, and then we talk about resource-rich countries. And we have a strategy for China and India, and we have a strategy for resource-rich countries, of which we think about Indonesia kind of in the same way we might think about Brazil or or uh, or uh, the Middle East or other countries around the world. And your task is to take this great wealth created by iron ore and oil and natural gas, and how do you turn that into a long-term industrial future? And this, by the way, is the same pathway that uh, all these other countries are going on, Brazil and, and, and the Middle East. And we want GE to be a partner in this process. We want, we want countries like Indonesia to think about us. We can provide the infrastructure that's needed to make that transition. We can also invest in capability as you make that transition. Capability comes in the form of technology, it comes in the form of factories, it comes in the form of training, all of which we plan to do here. So our task is to continue to drive more localization. Uh, the next big initiative, I would say, in Indonesia for GE would be to invest in a big leadership uh, and uh, training facility, kind of a customer innovation center if you will, so that we can do a better job of training our people that are going to go to work on an oil field or a locomotive factory, but also doing leadership training and those things as well in the country. And we want GE to be well placed as Indonesia goes through this progression that transfers from being just a resource driven economy to being a more diversified industrial uh, driven uh, economy, which is something that we can uh, uh, lead and participate in. And I think in addition, the advantage Indonesia has is its positioning in Asia, which is also uh, quite possible. So, you know, we've always had a long-term view. It's a luxury you have, uh, I think, in, as, a, as a company, and we've always taken that uh, perspective. You know, I, I think the, um, you know, it's always, uh, there are always things that you come here and say, I'd like to see these two or three things happen differently. But you know, sitting in an economy that's close to 7% growth uh, in the world today ain't bad. That's a pretty good starting point. And, and there's a lot that we, we think we can build on uh, in, in Indonesia. So the world, I think, is the world. You know, you're going to, we could be standing here two years from now, let's say 2015. And we could be in, a, in an identical global economy to the one we're in today. Identical. That's the plan, you know, if you're okay with that, if you've prepared your country or your company to be okay with that, then you're going to be successful. And if there's upside, if suddenly Europe or the U.S. started growing back on potential again, that's upside for us. But we're ready for the same world we see today. Uh, GE is a great infrastructure partner to the country, to Indonesia, long-term investor. And we've tried to think through the five things I talked about today, gas, manufacturing, localization, industrial internet, simplification. So it's great to be with you. It's, thanks for all the great support that you guys have given uh, at GEO over the years. And I think we can take questions. Yes. Or, yeah, great. Thank you very much.